not quite sure the best way to proceed. I think um, I can, uh, if you'd like, I can talk a little bit about how the book came to be and how I came to be in Alaska and sort of, um, you know, lead up to the printing of the book and read a few things. And then I'd love to really kind of answer questions and see what kind of conversation people would like to carry forward. If that, does that work? Yeah, <clears throat> okay, um, well, good. Um, <clears throat> so my name's Tom Kaziah. And um, I, uh, um, I came to Alaska <clears throat> right out of college in the 70s. Um, actually, I grew up in the East Coast in New Jersey, went to school in Western Massachusetts and um, uh, came to Alaska first on a mountain climbing expedition. <clears throat> we were um, doing a first ascent of Mount Tom White down near Cordova, we floated the Copper River and spent 20 days up on the ice field climbing this mountain. And so it was really like a six week trip to Alaska. And I thought <clears throat> this was um, going to be the beginning of a, of a distinguished career of first ascents, but it was my last first ascent and I kind of let the mountain climbing slide. But I saw enough of Alaska in that summer visit to think uh, that I really wanted to come back um, after graduating. My idea was to um, launch a career in journalism. And um, I thought Alaska would be a good place to start um, for a couple of years, uh, sort of an exotic beginning, uh, and then um, move, um, move on <clears throat> in the newspaper world and uh, climb the, the career ladder. But I got to Alaska <clears throat> and a lot of um, unexpected things happened. Um, um, one thing was realizing what a great subject Alaska was for journalism. And this new book, I think I wrote it as half as a historian and half as a journalist. Um, but I was, I interviewed when I came up here out of college uh, at the big, at the Anchorage papers and at the news miner in Fairbanks. Um, and the news miner actually offered me a job, but I had in the meantime, come down to Homer to visit some college friends who had moved here ahead of me. And they were involved in the Homer news and, and roped me into uh, running the, the weekly paper because they'd never had a, anybody who'd had any journalism experience before. And I had just the college newspaper, but that was more than anybody else had. So I ended up moving in, into Homer and uh, settling here for, for four years um, where I ran the paper and, and worked as a deckhand on a commercial fishing boat and learned enough carpentry to build a cabin and do all the sorts of things one might do um, when you got to Alaska in your twenties. Um, and so it wasn't until the 1980s that I finally made it to Anchorage and working for the Anchorage Daily News. Um, <clears throat> and it was um, during um, that period, 1983, I was a police reporter for the Anchorage Daily News when I first went out to McCarthy. I was, um, I went out there on an early morning charter flight <clears throat> the morning after we got word that there had been a mass shooting and a mass murder out there. Um, so I went out as a police reporter and um, it was kind of a, it was really a haunting experience to show up in a isolated ghost town and find it hard to find anyone to talk to because everyone had been killed the day before. Um, there were troopers around and I, I write about this in the beginning of this new book. Um, it took me you know, um, 40 years almost to, to unburden myself of the ghosts that uh, had haunted me about this period. Um, but I really, it, <clears throat> it was a fascinating community and I wanted to know more who were these people who, who lived here and who were the survivors and, and what, what exactly had happened. Um, <clears throat> so then I <clears throat> returned to Anchorage and, you know, continued my my life, but by coincidence, I uh, 
you know, fell in love and got married to a, a young environmentalist who was building her own cabin out in McCarthy and had her own history. And so I found myself going back to McCarthy, um, getting to know the community a lot better and um, sort of developing my own um, involvement with, with the community out there. Um, and uh, it was at that time, because I knew people out there and, and we went back and forth, that I heard about um, in uh, early 2000s, I heard about this big strange family that had moved into the area that was um, causing quite a stir with people lining up on both sides about whether they were a good, a good addition to the community or a harmful one. And this was the Pilgrim family. Um, <clears throat> I was interested in them as a um, reporter because I was always looking for stories for the Anchorage Daily News that, that would talk about this moment in Alaska history that we're living through. It seemed like such a, a, a transitional period from the 70s on, you know, with the native land claims and the coming of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline you know, oil money pouring into the state um, and the passage of Anilka, the, the uh, Alaska National Parks and Refuges Bill. Um, so many big changes were, were happening in Alaska all at once. Made a great story, ongoing story for me as a writer and as a journalist. And, um, you know, I, um, I was, so I was looking for stories that would, would characterize that what was going on and this this battle between this guy calling himself Papa Pilgrim and the National Park Service really seemed to capture something about the period uh, you know of learning to um, accept or live with the national parks that had um, come into being in Alaska or or to resist them or to sort of look back into the past and say you know, we, um, we don't want to have that kind of uh, land protection in Alaska. So, so this was a real human, you know, battle going on out there that talked about those bigger issues. And so I was drawn to writing about them and had done a couple of stories and then was uh, I wangled an invitation out to their homestead outside of McCarthy, 13 miles up a, a valley in the wilderness. And and um, uh, when I got up there for the night, um, it was hard to um, stay focused on the national park issues because there was something much stranger and darker going on in this family of 15 children. And I could hardly um, figure out what it was, but um, that became a big story for the next Three, year, three or four years. Um, and I eventually wrote a book about it, which was Pilgrim's Wilderness. Um, so that was published in 2013. Um, and um, that uh, kind of told the whole story of this family and uh, the abusive father who was keeping his children kind of prisoner in the wilderness out there. Um, his, uh, he, he had a, a Robert Hale was his name, the, the Papa Pilgrim. And he had a whole tissue of lies that he told about the Bible and about his own Christian beliefs and about history and about what, you know, certainly about his, his family's life. Um, because I was trying to pierce that, I tried to learn about the history of McCarthy myself. And I wrote a few chapters for that book about Here's what actually happened in the time that McCarthy was a ghost town. So just to back up, you know, McCarthy, if you, you may be familiar with it, I hope. <clears throat> it's in the Wrangell Mountains near, you know, near the border of Canada, um, you know, um, north of Valdez and Cordova. And um, it was a boom town in the early parts of the 20th century as a copper deposit in there was developed by Kennecott Copper. Um, they built a rail, 200 mile railroad in and when the um, copper 
got low and it was the depression, the prices were low. They just pulled out practically overnight. My book starts with the last train out. There's been great, you know, the National Park Service and others have written about the history of the, um, of that, uh, you know, the, the mining period, but I wanted to um, tell the story of what happened after the mining company left. Um, so I begin with the last train out. And for 50 years, it was a ghost town out there, um, just kind of an abandoned place, but an abandoned place in Alaska attracts a certain kind of person. Um, and uh, so I wanted to first wrote, write about that in the Pilgrim's Wilderness um, book, but working with my editor at Random House, um, it just seemed like that was ultimately too much of a distraction from the main sort of galloping story of Pilgrim's Wilderness, which was about the effort of the children to escape their fathers, um, their, their, to escape the, you know, their, their prison in the wilderness. Um, and uh, so we, we pulled those chapters out or I kind of boiled them down to about a page instead of a whole chapter. Um, but when I <clears throat> did a reading of the, from the new book out in, out in Kennecott, my neighbors out there really wanted to hear the parts that I had pulled out of the, um, out of the book because they were really interested in what that time was like um, before it became a national park because the park was created by Congress in 1980. And there was about a 10 year period where the park began to move in and, and take uh, command in the area. Um, but my period that I was looking at in this new book is 1938, which was the closing of the copper mines to 1980 which was the coming of the National Park in 1983, which was really when the curtain fell on the ghost town community with the time of those murders. Um, so I pulled those chapters out and of, of the first book and I said, well, I'll just, um, the, the museum wanted copies of them out there and because uh, no one had really written much about that ghost town period at that point. And I said, let me just expand them as a, a bit of a, um, fundraiser for the museum, we'll do a little book. And um, that seemed like a great idea, but then it kind of took off because there was just so much good material. And I would, it was a kind of writing about the ghost town theme seemed to encapsulate so much of what I um, had found fascinating about Alaska as a subject for all those years that I'd been working as a reporter. And so, um, I just kept going deeper and deeper. It ended up being a three-year project and we printed this, um, this book, um, printed it in Alaska. I can you know, talk about how we, the, the new publisher who started up to, to publish this book. Um, and uh, certainly went way beyond the uh, couple of chapters that I had, uh, I had originally proposed um, to do. So I, I, this is what I wrote about the, the town just at the beginning when I was sort of starting out to write about it. Um, you know, after the Great Depression, after the Kennecott Copper Corporation left and the rails were torn out, a small isolated community had carried on into the modern pipeline era as a kind of rumor to the rest of us. In the geography of Alaskan romance, McCarthy had a reputation as a hermit kingdom, contrary and self-reliant, where settlers tougher than the rest of us were salvaging in post-apocalyptic fashion, the rusted relics of a profligate past. My neighbors out there wanted to hear stories from the lost decades. That's what I decided I would start calling them. When this familiar landscape of ruins that we knew supported an odd, weirdly vibrant community of scavengers and schemers, a town half dead, alders clawing at its foundations, but half brimming with a kind of entrepreneurial brio that Mark Twain wrote about on an earlier Western mining frontier. This human persistence in the ruins often confounded visitors who arrived 
with preconceived notions of ghost towns, as Chris Richards, the self-proclaimed mayor of Kennecott, complained whenever he found tourists trying to lift tools and other relics off his porch. That was my subject matter and um, you know, human persistence in the wilderness. And uh, it really um, grew, you know, it, we're a frontier state, but we're not very good at looking at the past. Um, we um, are always kind of looking for the next boom. And um, so it seemed like a, um, a, a chance to sort of dwell on on what had happened here, um, you know, and then very clearly that the time period that I'm writing most of most of what happened in the you know 60s and 70s is the coming of oil to Alaska in the in the you know outside part of Alaska. Um, and McCarthy was very cut off from that in some ways, but also influenced by by the changes that were happening in the rest of Alaska and. Um, as the it, Kennecott became, for some people, a kind of metaphor for for the oil boom. You know, the the big copper boom that had happened. The railroad was kind of like the pipeline, and all this act, industrial activity and money, and then poof, it went away. So it seemed like kind of a potential metaphor for a future for Alaska when um, it becomes not a ghost town but a ghost state. You know, um, when the oil uh, companies leave, what's going to be left here? Um, the politicians um, at the time that Kennecott left were the Alaska territorial politicians like Ernest Greening and Bob Bartlett were quite, um, you know, upset about um, what Kennecott had done, basically that they had, there had not been any taxation levied or hardly any, and, you know, there was no real lasting benefit to Alaska from this you know, 30, 40 years of industrial activity. Um, he said they left a hole in the ground in three ghost towns. That was Greening's comment. And uh, Bob Bartlett gave a rousing speech at the, at the um, Constitutional Convention um, about making sure that Alaska benefits from its natural resources and doesn't just give them away to these outside corporations that come in and and uh, take and and then leave and um, that had a lot to do with that and and the um, Alaska Statehood Act had a lot to do with the creation of the permanent fund for uh, you know uh, taking royalties from from the um, from the oil um, and basically you know uh, we all know, how important that permanent fund has become to Alaska and to Alaskans. Um, so that I think you can draw a pretty direct line from the experiences of Kennecott's abandonment to, uh, to the creation of that fund and to look ahead and see what's going to happen now with oil kind of winding down. <clears throat> anyway, um, let me. Um, so, um, it was hard to, um, there, you know, there wasn't much material to tell the story of that period from the 1930s to the 1980s out in McCarthy. Um, a lot of it was interviews and searching around for letters, um, and, uh, pulling these anecdotes and characters together. Um, and, um, that was, um, that was the, you know, and then, then of course, there was the story of the, the killings um, that it kind of conclude the story, the whole book concludes with that story. Um, and that was a really tough one to write. Um, it was one that the community itself had resisted talking about for a long time, um, because they didn't want to be remembered just as the town where this awful thing had happened. Um, and I understood that and I had sort of incorporated that, but at the same time, I couldn't ignore that. I mean, it was a huge 
part of the town's life. Um, and so, um, so I do write about that. And, and then I did feel like that kind of brought the period of my book to an end. It, there, was, there was the first ghost town, and then there was kind of a second ghost town when, uh, when the people who had lived in the ghost town were no longer there. So the time I'm looking back on was a kind of a, a more recent past. Um, and uh, a lot of the work in my book was to try to figure out how to write about that. Um, so let's see, I could, would you like me to read a few sections? What do you think, uh, Joy, Barb, would that be a- Yes, thank you. Good, good thing to do. All right, I can do that. Let's see. Um, maybe I'll start by talking about um, some of the old timers who were there. You know, there were some, some who stayed on after the um, last train left, just a handful who lived in the mountains there. And um, a lot of my, of this book um, is uh, told, it's kind of strung together along the storyline of the life of Jim Edwards, who was a homesteader who moved to the area in the early 1950s, um, young guy and ended up having a family out there and lived there, was still living there in the 80s. In fact, um, his wife, Maxine, was, um, was killed in the shootings. Um, and uh, his, his son, Steve, still has a place out there, still is part of the community. Uh, Jim himself died just a few years back. Um, so I, I kind of used Jim Edwards' life as a, as a spine for the story. And this, I'm gonna read, uh, when he, a section from when he first showed up, landed his small plane in this ghost town in the Wrangell Mountains and was looking around and thinking, wow, maybe I could live here. Um, and there were still a handful of people who had been there during the Kennecott copper boom, you know, 15 years before and had seen the last train go. And some of them, a few of them said good riddance um, and liked the, uh, liked the valley being quiet now. So Jim Edwards landed at the, at the runway there. <clears throat> Model T with wooden sides rattled up to the airstrip to see who landed. By 1953, the mines had been closed for more than a decade. The driver of the Model T, Bill Berry, was one of the few who stayed around. He was constantly striking matches to relight his roll your own cigarette snuffed by his dripping nose. A short, agitated tinker in his 70s. He was known as Blazo Bill for his practice of starting fires in wood stoves without kindling. He invited Edwards up for a cup of tea at the old hardware store where he'd taken up residence. The wood stove in the kitchen was cold when they walked in. Edwards recalled watching his host dump a number three wash tub off the top of the stove, 20 gallons of cold, dirty water spreading across the floor. I was looking around amazed, Jim said, and Bill said, there's a hole that runs down, no big deal. Bill Berry stuffed three big logs in the stove and threw in a match while spraying blazo gas through a blowtorch. Out of consideration for his guest and all the smoke, he refrained from smearing grease on the bottom of the teapot to make it heat up faster. Blazo Bill Berry was a multi-talented handyman who made excellent whiskey out of carrots. Edwards found him funnier than the Dickens despite a tendency to brood about his enemies. Barry had been a skinny boxing champion in the Navy and one afternoon got in a fight with big Billy Howell back for a friendly visit. Bystanders rushed to separate the fighters, both in their late seventies, rolling in the street before they hurt themselves. Living at the old watch old hardware store, Barry locked himself into the windowless cold storage room every night so that Ernie Gherkin could not sneak in and murder him. His years at the hardware store left a mark. I thought of Blazo Bill a lot in my early days, said a woman who bought and restored the building years later, its kitchen walls still blackened by explosions and turned it into the iconic hardware store. In the time before the airplane, Bill Berry had all the local transportation angles figured. He once carried mail over the Wrangell Mountains on horseback to the Gold Rush Camp at Shoshana. In summer, he traveled along the farcically 
precipitous Chittistone Canyon goat trail, and in winter over an all ice route that ascended a glacier called Whiskey Hill. For treading above the fern line, Barry fashioned horse snowshoes from potato boxes. His truck provided McCarthy's private coal and ice delivery. And after the last train left, he operated the rail speeder to Chitna. Barry built a hand pulled cable tram across the Kennecott River Rapids when the rail bridge into town washed out. He drove a truck with the engine and drivetrain of a Model T, but a body built of salvaged lumber, which he said flexed better than steel on the boulder strewn glacial moraine where the town sat. The problem was the temptation to peel apart his truck in winter when it got cold. Firewood was an obsession in those hand tool days. The spruce forest around McCarthy leveled for lumber and stove wood in boom times it was just starting to grow back. Standing deadwood was hard to find. Winter settled in at 30 below. Bill Berry had the only power saw and it weighed literally a ton. The blade was powered by a sputtering, banging, one cylinder horizontal engine with a big flywheel and a 30 foot belt. One winter, when he would go away to trap on the pea vine bar, Barry noticed his wood pile in town shrinking. He drilled holes in the ends of a few stove cut logs, filled them with 22 rounds and covered the holes with wood putty. Then he notched the logs so he'd recognize them and put them on top of his pile. A few nights after he left on his next trapping run to the pea vine, visitors in town were awakened by the sound of gunfire and found Ernie Gherkin standing in snow outside his cabin in long underwear. A former Klondike man, Ernie Gherkin had a bosky beard and wore long underwear with a stain that darkened noticeably as summer progressed. He was a widower. On the night of the big fire back in 1940, Ernie saved the life of Blanche Smith, who did laundry in the town. She had started out working in McCarthy in the row of shacks down by the creek where children were forbidden to go. Blanche boasted of being the first white woman in the mining camp of Shoshana, by which she meant the first non-native as she herself was black. Blanche and Ernie got married and lived together happily. She passed away shortly before Jim Edwards arrived. Ernie buried her in the McCarthy Cemetery and said one day he would lie there beside her. This town's small graveyard lay beyond the old railroad turntable. Trees were starting to reclaim it. Of the 50 or so plots inside the fence, several graves were marked with brass plaques, others with rock piles or rotting wooden crosses. Some had finished going back to nature. A few were fresh. When the town was booming, they, were, they would dig a supply of beckoning grave holes in summer to be ready on a first come first served basis once the days grew short and the ground froze. After the last train left, if you wanted to be buried there, it was helpful to die in summer. In the winter of 1948, a man named Brunswick had a heart attack while waiting for the mail plane. The German caretakers at Kennecott described in a letter home how they ran down to town to get wool blankets, quote, but there was no need for us to run back up. Brunswick didn't need any more help. The burial dilemma was, was averted when the man's son summoned a charter plane to take the body away, but an intense freeze imposed a two week weather wait during which the outbound cargo lay on a sled wrapped in sailcloth. Ernie Gherkin moved to Cordova in his last years and Bill Berry may have imagined that with his enemy gone, he would be the last old timer ever planted in McCarthy's graveyard. Blazo Bill died peacefully, not incandescently, and was buried there with his buddies. A thin lead plate was wired to a post stamped with the words, William H. Berry born November 1879, died August 1958. Two years later, Ernie Gherkin's body was flown back from Cordova in accordance with his last wishes. His friends laid him to rest beside Blanche Smith, thus completing the last burial in McCarthy's cemetery. The ground was frozen and they used dynamite to open the grave.
So there's a story of some of the old timers who were there um, when, when uh, the when the um, when the new newcomers started to to appear, uh, you know, in the fifties, new people began to discover this valley, this sort of beautiful area. I mean, it's it's an incredible. If any of you have been out there, it's an incredible um, place. Um, these towering white peaks and um, glaciers and and the history just adds to the sense of, of remoteness, like you've gone into another time and place. Um, and it was very appealing to certain people who were willing to do the hard work that it took to live there. Um, and then in the 70s, there was kind of another, another wave of migration, a little bit bigger. It was young people at this point, um, kind of refugees from the modern world, um, looking for a place to live close to nature. And um, some of them moved out there and found, um, found support from the old timers who were there before them. Um, and I was gonna read one more part about um, a young woman who um, moved out there in the mid seventies and how she drew on support from Jim Edwards' wife, Maxine. The young woman's name was Bonnie Morris. Bonnie was a skin sewer of leather and fur. On winter nights, she made parkas on a treadle sewing machine in the little cabin by headlamp. When she first arrived with her boyfriend in the fall of 1977, lugging a box of books on Taoism and old Rex beach novels, she was struck not so much by the isolation as by the community, and in particular, a handful of tough and savvy local women, in some ways playing traditional women's roles, but also liberated by the need to take care of everything on their own. Bonnie had grown up hearing Alaska stories of wrestling grizzly bears and striking it rich, as she said, very male-oriented fantasies. The women she saw now were the unsung heroes. They could operate a caterpillar, roll a 55 gallon drum of diesel onto a porch, shoot a bear off the porch and skin it. But they also had an artful way of turning a social visit into a tea party, unlike their laconic and insufficiently appreciative husbands. Bonnie noticed these women often stayed isolated from one another if their husbands didn't get along. Yet they pro provided moments of grace in the wilderness. Kelly and Bonnie set up a canvas 10 by 12 foot wall tent that October and commenced to cutting logs for their cabin. They were hoping to make quick work of the cabin, but the temperature soon plunged to 40 below and stayed in that vicinity for five weeks. It was an exceptional cold spell, even for the upper Chitna River Valley. Joan Wasserman had her picture taken next to a thermometer that read minus 64. It was impossible to keep a wall tent warm, especially with nothing but young green second growth for firewood. Bonnie could sit on the wood stove. The only escape from the temperature inversions that locked down the valley floor was to climb to a friend's angle station cabin along the old tram lines above Kennecott, where it might be 50 degrees warmer. By midwinter, all Bonnie could think about was their next meal and their clothing. The frozen laundry, stiff as cardboard, took up half the tent. The new cabin's walls were still only two logs high. A decade later, Bonnie Morris recalled what those pioneer women meant to her that first winter. And this is quoting what Bonnie told an interviewer. About midway into the winter, I found that I was crying a lot and that I was overwhelmed, feeling like I'd bit off more than I could chew, and yet I felt really committed to this project. It was going so slowly and it was so hard, I felt like I was really starting to lose it. I remember thinking I'd go over and visit Maxine Edwards and take the day off. So I made a thermos and took a little rucksack and I had bunny boots. 
I remember walking across the Kennecott River and I didn't know much about ice then or crossing ice or how to read ice with running rivers under it. And I went through slush ice along the side and got a little wet and had water in my boots. It was pretty cold in January and the days were really short. So it would have taken the whole day to walk over there. I'd have to spend the night and then come back the next day. It was a two day journey because we had such short days, not like it is in the summer. So I get over there and I was wet, tired and cold and ragged out anyway. And I got over there and their house had a sense of order where you thought it was always like that. I had no idea. They started with brown chore gloves and a big alder grove and cleared it and built it. So I walk into this nice home and I remember there was this big three decker chocolate cake sitting on this glass cake plate with a glass lid and Maxine asked, do you want a piece of cake? I'd been cooking on a Coleman stove. So I said, of course, I'd love a piece of cake. And I felt I was too dirty to sit in any of their furniture. And she served it on a little China plate with a little China teacup. And she could kind of see my state. So I had the piece of cake and I looked up at her and I said, Maxine, when you first came out here, did you ever cry? She looked me right in the eye and said, cry? I couldn't stop crying for five years after I realized what I'd gotten myself into. I sort of burst out crying and laughing and thinking how I was getting this big lump in my throat and the tears just started pouring out and I said, oh, and I thought there was something wrong with me. That's the, the women's experience out there um, in that tough life. Um, uh, one other thing I'll mention is the, the title of the book, Cold Mountain Path, comes from the um, Chinese poetry from like the seventh century of a poet named Han Shan, whose poems were um, translated by the modern Western poet, um, Gary Snyder. And um, these poems were important to several people in the in the book, including Bonnie Morris. Um, and so I, when I found my way to the poems and read them, I thought, boy, these really kind of, in some ways speak to the experience of, of a lot of the people who found their way out into the Wrangell Mountains and um, were trying to uh, make a, a different sort of life out there. What was it that appealed to them? Why would they put up with such, such difficulty? Um, and um, so I'll just read one of these short poems. It was, this is the epigraph that I use in part three, um, Gary Snyder's Cold Mountain Poems. Men ask the way to Cold Mountain. Cold Mountain, there's no through trail. In summer, ice doesn't melt. The rising sun blurs in swirling fog. How did I make it? My heart's not the same as yours. If your heart was like mine, you'd get it and be right here. It's a kind of Zen Buddhism of the mountains of China in the seventh century. And it speaks to the cold mountains of Alaska and that experience. So, so I'm done blabbing, but I would be, I'd love to um, see if people have had a chance to read the book or perhaps saw just the review and might have questions about the whole project or or just you know what it was like to be a newspaper reporter for the Anchorage Daily News for 25 years like I was um, or Pilgrim family or anything else. Is, well, I, have a memory, I have a memory of my trip across the ferry the, that is the ferry that um, was a cable across the tram the, car. The tram car, yeah, and went over there fairly early when I came to Alaska, and had a wonderful time wandering around and talking to people and doing all these things. And I really appreciate your um, your comments about 
what that was like because I had almost forgotten it. Um, it was uh, a long time ago, but not that long. <laughs> anyway, yeah, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, that was, I think, part of my inspiration for doing this book. A big part, really, was to try to capture something that was about to be lost. And, you know, it was an earlier time in Alaska, um, but it actually survived in McCarthy a lot longer than it did in other places um, because you, because it was so isolated. It kind of, the, the old Alaska lived on an extra generation out there. So, so as a modern day writer and reporter, I could go around and talk to people who had lived that life and, and capture the stories before they had, you know, disappeared altogether. Um, it was like I was looking back into a, a, another century um, just because we had this sort of convenient place that saved old Alaska into our, into our generation. Um, and I did realize that these stories were gonna disappear if I didn't capture them, you know? And so um, that was what I did. And people were, I mean, you, you probably know, um, people are kind of guarded about telling the old stories until a certain point. And then they think, oh, I better, start talking, not, I better let these out because um, I don't really want to take them to the grave. And so um, I hit it, I think I was there at just the right moment when people were willing to start um, sharing their memories. And, and uh, um, partly, as I say in the introduction, they wanted to um, get their story down before the other guy's version of events became the accepted with them. <laughs> May I ask a question? Where yeah. no, make a comment. Yes. I am by profession an historian. Actually, I'm retired now. Susan, excuse me. My dog needs to go outside, but before I take her out, I need to tell you that I think that this is a really great contribution to Alaska history. Thank you that you have made, excuse me. Okay, we can oh, talk okay. about that after your dog has been satisfied. Anyone else or do, how do you wanna? Yeah, I have a question. Um, hi, <laughs> uh, I have not read this book yet. I look forward to doing it. I read the earlier uh, Pilgrim's Wilderness and really enjoyed it. Um, but I'm wondering, you mentioned, something that you said in your, in your, I think it was the first section you were reading about Blanche maybe being the, the, uh, the only non-native woman. And I, was, I think she was black, but I was kind of interesting, white, or the white woman, I forget what you said. But anyway, I'm just wondering about, you haven't said anything about the, were there indigenous people are, the, you know, in that area, was there any, what's, what's, what was the presence there? Yeah, I have a couple of sections on that in the book. Um, it's, um, you know, the Atna people who had um, traveled and used that valley um, as part of their territory. Um, and they particularly used it for hunting um, and it's kind of seasonal camps. And they would also gather copper from the river. They, they call native copper is like pure little ingots of pure copper. And unlike the copper deposits that were um, mined out of Kennecott, um, which was a ore, but an incredibly valuable high, high uh, percentage copper ore, just little bits of pure copper that could be used without smelting could be heated and hammered into, into implements. So um, it was an important um, uh, source of copper for the Atna people. And, um, but they um, were pretty much flushed out of the valley by the by the boom by the mining boom um and moved down to the copper river where the you know fishing was better and where they had sort of more of a as especially as you know in territorial days as the um schools were set up the um native populations were encouraged to move into villages and so chitna the village of chitna became the 
the native center for the, the region. Um, and by the time the uh, Native Land Claims Act came along, the whole region up around Kennecott and McCarthy in the upper Chitna River Valley was um, off limits to selection for the Atna people um, because it had been first the mine and then uh, it was all federal land that was being had been set aside for possible national park for becoming Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think in, in while I, I don't want to, uh, and there were still very much native people around, a few native workers um, on the railroad, um, but in a certain sense, they were the first ghosts of the valley before the miners became ghosts um, in that it was their, their country and then it was no longer their country. Um, and uh, I guess during the period that I'm writing about in, you know, from the late thirties into the eighties, um, there was little, if any, Alaska native, um, at least re uh, Atna people um, living and involved in that region that I'm writing about. I do talk a, a little bit about Chitna and what was going on there, but that's not my main focus. So, so there were definitely um, uh, sort of an indigenous presence, but it was almost a, more of a memory um, up there. And like most um, American frontier towns, the uh, question of whatever happened to the people who used to live here didn't really occur to the people who were um, building the new town. That's not something that um, they ever tended to dwell on very much until maybe our age where we kind of go, wait a minute, what do we just do? Um, uh, so um, there was um, one other uh, black man who lived in the valley and um, really one of the most fascinating characters in the whole book, um, uh, a man named George Flowers. Um, and there's a fairly big section on him. He, he was there when Kennecott, when the last train left and he said good, he was the one who said good riddance. He was by then a trapper. He had been a Mississippi sharecropper and he, he took a, rode a freight train to Seattle and then walked according to the best information we can get. Couldn't get on a steamship and walked to Alaska um, with gold fever showed up in the teens and um, couldn't get hired at Kennecott because they wouldn't hire black people. Um, he did work at some of the smaller gold mines in the Dan Creek area and learned to, to take care of himself in the wilderness, became a trapper and a hunter and had a big garden and he set up a, built his own cabin right by the Lackanaw River, which had a salmon run coming up into Long Lake. And um, he lived a subsistence hunting and trapping life. And he, his life got a lot better um, when the train left and all the, all the um, industrial activity evacuated from the valley. And the reason we know a lot about him is that, or at least some about him, is that he had a he lived at near Long Lake, um, which was used as a kind of summer camp for the managerial class at Kennecott. They would take the train to Long Lake and it looked like a, a you know, trees and swimming and, and lawns. And it was kind of a nice little spot to go get away from the, all the pounding and noise and dust up at, at Kennecott at the mines. And it was also away from the, you know, saloons and, and whorehouses and things in, in McCarthy. And so um, he got to know the children, the families would go out there and George Flowers became kind of the friend to all the children um, who would, would go there. He played the guitar for them. Um, and uh, there was one young man in particular whose father ran the, the food service at Kennecott and um, his mother had been, okay, this is a little complicated, but his mother had been the daughter of the miner who first met George Flowers when he showed up 
bedraggled having walked to Alaska. He walked into a native village in the, of Mentasta, um, north of the Wrangells, and they said, whoa, who's this? Um, and they quickly took him over to the nearby mining camp. And the guy who ran that mining camp talked to George Flowers and said, this is a very interesting person. Um, you know, and he played the guitar for him and, and uh, became friends with that family. So that miner's daughter married the guy who worked at Kennecott. And so that miner's grandson was the little boy who learned to, to fish from George Flowers and wrote letters to him um, after the train left. So we have a few letters from George Flowers to this boy, this teenage boy, after he moved back up to Fairbanks, his family moved to Fairbanks. This little boy grew up to be a full professor of uh, anthropology at uh, the University of Wisconsin. Um, and so a very credible um, witness um, on, in his recollections of the old black trapper, George Flowers, who, um, who he got to spend time with as a boy in, in Long Lake. Um, George Flowers, um, lived until sometime during the World War II. He was in his early 70s by then. He broke through the ice while he was out trapping and um, soaked his legs. He was able to get back to his cabin, um, but his leg, his lower, his feet were frozen. Um, and by the time friends got to him, gangrene had set in. They took him to, um, to Valdez, where there was a hospital. Um, but the people in the hospital couldn't save his life. Um, and so then his friends, including this friend um, who became the professor, um, sought to bury him. And they were told they couldn't bury him in the Valdez Community Cemetery because of his race. They had to go um, find the Indian Cemetery and bury him there. Um, nobody even really is quite sure what the Indian Cemetery is or was. Um, apparently some part of the old, old town of Valdez that was wiped out by the, by the uh, tsunami in 1964. Um, so there's quite a story. Um, George Flowers, the, the only black man in the valley. You said you were from New Jersey. What, yeah. Where? I grew up in Summit, New Jersey. Oh. Yeah. Barb Barber and, and I both came from to here from New Jersey. From where? Well, we were we were at Rutgers, uh, New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara came from London. I came from Verona. Uh huh. Verona. We beat Verona in high in soccer in my high school <laughs> team. Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> The year I was in it then. <laughs> I remember that was a big game. Um, you, you, talked, you talked about the uh, pulling up the rails from, from, the, uh, from the railroad. Uh, they pulled up the rails, but they didn't pull up the uh, ties. And that, that made that, that road a real treat uh, to, uh, to drive in the early days. I guess they improved it quite a bit now. And that, uh, that tram across the... Uh, across the, the rapids um, had hook actually had a, hooks on it. You could hook a bicycle onto it. And in fact, one of our trips up, up out there, my son brought his bicycle and, and did uh, carry it across. And then he used that to, to go up to the, the old mine. Was that a trip after 83 or before 83, do you think? Um, that was, it was before the, there was any uh, national park. Well, but in the 80s, there was, it was a yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm park on sure. paper, but there weren't any rangers out there. They were. I know, I know the first, the first time I went out there, uh, the road hadn't been improved at all. Mm -hmm. And it still had the tram over. And, uh, and that was a real treat. <laughs> well, there was a, yeah, I was there. Um, I, you know, I was there in March of 83 when the murders happened, um, just for the day. I, yeah, this would have been, I think before that. Well, I think it was after. Yeah. And then, then um, 
I, I returned in August um, to write a story about how the town was recovering. And I talk about that in the last chapter of, the, of this book. Um, that was the summer that they rebuilt the tram. And I think wow. it was the tram, the new tram that they put the hooks on for bicycles and um, kind of really improved it. The old tram dated from the fifties and it sagged so much um, that when you had the weight of two people on it, um, they got their feet wet in the, <laughs> in the rapids. Um, and it was a difficult thing to pull yourself up the second half, the first half was easy getting out to the rapids. And then when you're dangling over the whitewater, it was hard work to pull yourself up the other side. So they needed yes. a tighter cable and, and better carts. And um, what they, the interesting thing was there was obviously pressure to put a bridge in as there had been a bridge at one point. Um, but the community at that point decided they didn't want better access that as one of them, or as more than one of them said to me, if you could drive to McCarthy, it wouldn't be here. Um, you know, they were using transportation as a way to um, control the future of their community. There was just, just not a lot of space for, for one thing, to park vehicles um, either at Kennecott or in McCarthy. And um, there was one, when they put that road in over the old railroad right of way in the early 70s, they, you know, made a gravel road and for and they put built a wooden bridge in right into town um <clears throat> and there was one summer that they said it was kind of bumper to bumper rvs and pickup trucks around in the ghost town um and people were like helping themselves to artifacts from the old old buildings and and uh the the people who lived out there had been helping themselves to artifacts for years, but they got really defensive about outsiders coming and, and taking them. So they started like patrolling the bridge. Um, but what the what uh, the bridge builders hadn't really sufficiently anticipated was the annual Yokelup, which is the discharge of a hidden lake up in the glacier, because this river comes pouring off the face of a glacier just above town um, and but there's a hidden lake farther up the glacier that annually fills to a certain level and then dumps and all the water comes rushing under the ice and pours out and suddenly the river is three times as high for for you know 24 hours or 36 hours and then it subsides and mm -hmm. the first time the glacier lake dumped the bridge got knocked out um, and that's why they went back to a, um, a, a tram car um, as a, you know, expedient, um, a way you could get in, get across without getting the, the trestle washed out. And uh, it wasn't until the 97, I believe, that they finally built what they have now, which is a footbridge into town with um, uh, not wooden pilings, but, you know, steel. Um, pilings to bury deep in the in the boulders in the bottom of the river <clears throat> to be able to withstand that that flood and even there when they built that they built it with um with the idea of keeping the vehicles out that they would have it as a footbridge and the reason they everybody went along with that was that lines were getting so long to take that tram across um, that even for the locals, um, it was, uh, you know, waiting two hours to get across was not reasonable. Yeah. First time we were, I went out there was, or it would have been early to mid seventies. And uh, you still had, you still had the, the old tram. The old would have. Yeah. Car, and uh, the, the road was extremely narrow. And you, <laughs> you, you came over a little rise. And the the the, uh, the gorge there, the two hundred and eighty foot drop to the to the, the Cuscalana River. That was was an old railroad bridge and had virtually no side rails. I mean, you just came out onto and it did, didn't even wasn't completed bo completely boarded over. And I had a big truck, and I stopped right in the middle of that thing and 
we started, uh, we were a bunch of mathematicians and we were dropping rocks and timing them to get an estimate of how, how, how high above the water we were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I, that was a can real I ask, uh, can I get us back to writing and ask you a little bit about uh, whether or not you're writing full time now? And uh, do you miss journalism? <clears throat> well, I'm writing pretty full time <clears throat> um, and it's still kind of journalism. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm glad to be away from the daily um, demands. I'm able to set my own course. I've done a few magazine pieces. Um, that's been the biggest work that I've done other than working on these books. Um, I did, a, I wrote a couple of stories for the New Yorker magazine, um, one, one about um, climate change in Alaska and uh, that was kind of set in Point Hope. And then um, I did another piece for the Columbia Journalism Review, uh, kind of critiquing the press coverage of climate change in Alaska um, you know, by the Alaska press and the sort of difficulties and shortcomings. Um, and uh, so those are some chances to kind of stretch my brain and, um, but really the last uh, couple of years, I've been focused on trying to finish this book, which we just published in the fall. Um, and, uh, and now I um, am just trying to uh, sell the book, you know, and, but I've, you know, I have other things, other projects that are kind of jostling for attention now. And it's nice to have the chance to, to work on those and, um, I, I really liked being a journalist. Um, I feel like the world of journalism has changed a lot in even in the time since I left. I left, took a buyout from the Anchorage Daily News in 2009 to write, to begin work on the Pilgrim family book. And, um, and that, uh, that was a, you know, a great experience. And that was, that was very different. You know, that one was published in New York by a big, by Crown which is a random house imprint. And that one got the big ride, um, you know, um, nationally and uh, lots of reviews and attention. And um, Amazon put it in their top 10 books of the year list, um, that sort of thing, um, where this book, you know, especially because it started out as a local history that was going to help the museum, we published it with a, um, a, a young guy in um, McCarthy who had been an, was an arts administrator and a, and a published poet was interested in starting his own publishing house in Alaska and um, said, well, let, that'll be our first book. It would be perfect. And I agreed. And so um, Porphyry Press is the um, publisher of this book. Um, and um, it's uh, kind of surprised us, I think, in that it's, um, been such a big success in, in Alaska. Um, um, even without this review, which only appeared yesterday, um, in its first few months, it's almost sold out the first printing. Um, it just seemed like the right Christmas present for a lot of people, I think, this year. Um, so that was, um, um, it, that's been, been fun to see it. Um, see a lot of people reading it and talking about it. Um, but we, but it didn't have the kind of national push that, that the Pilgrim family book had. So I've <clears throat> sort of the, uh, you know, when you write a local history, you kind of, you have to decide whether you're gonna let it wander um, or try to really corral it and keep it focused on a, storyline that somebody in New York or Dubuque, Iowa, who doesn't have any particular interest in Alaska, but is interested in good stories, will sort of get into turning the page. And that's what the Pilgrim family story had. And this book does tend to meander more because it's a local history. And I wanted to tell, tell accurately the story of the people who are there and they don't all 
build toward the same, same you know, exciting, dramatic conclusion. Um, on the other hand, this book does have the, the murders at the end. And there was you know, some talk from New York of, well, if you want to write this as a, a true crime book, maybe we'd publish it here in New York. But I didn't want it to be that kind of a book, um, even though there's a lot about the victims and, and how the murder happened and who the guy was. Um, and uh, so I tried to set that in the context of the larger history and probably sacrificed maybe the, the national um, readership for the, for the local readership on this, this go around. That, but that was a choice. Were you actually there when, when, the, when the troopers uh, finally got the computer programmer that went nuts? Well, I was there, you know, the next morning. They, huh. they picked him up in the evening the night before as he was was fleeing the, the area. Yeah. Uh, so I flew out there. He actually killed one of the troopers in the helicopter. No, he didn't didn't kill any of the troopers. Um, but um, he was uh, they 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 landed right in front of him as he was trying to escape on a snow machine. He pretended he was someone else, but they 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 jumped out and sort of spread out and trained their rifles on him because they knew who he was. And um, he surrendered, but they saw that he had his glove off of his, uh, his gun hand. He had been ready to shoot it out with them, um, but he didn't, he surrendered and um, he's still in prison in um, last I knew. Well, he was in Seward for most of the time last I heard he was in Anchorage. I, I, Tried. I wrote him a letter to see if he wanted to talk for this book, um, and I never heard back, which was probably fine. I really enjoyed the way you presented it this way, and our book group read it, and everybody really enjoyed it. So thank you. No, oh, well, good. I, yeah, enjoying a murderous story of real people is is it's hard to talk about enjoying. But I kind of struggled with that in the the Pilgrim Family book too. You know, I mean. People who had read about Papa Pilgrim in the in my stories in the newspaper um, were probably thinking, "Ooh, I don't really want to know more about what this guy was doing to his kids." But I figured out a way to tell that story so that it was the story of the children kind of coming to consciousness and realizing they had to get out of there and how they did it, um, and that made it much more palatable and you know enjoyable. Yeah. story um and uh, i enjoyed that book yeah good good yeah and i i enjoyed this i mean maybe it isn't a good word to use but it, it you are a good storyteller and all the stories of the individual people were just fascinating great great yeah they, they deserved it so um thank you so, any more questions yeah Well, I'd certainly like to thank you uh, for your presentation. I enjoyed your book. I enjoyed your one book that I read, and I will certainly read this one. Yeah, good. I well, so my first book, I'll put in a plug for that, um, was is called "The Wake of the Unseen Object," and that was written in. Um, it was published in 1991. It was based on travels I did in rural Alaska, in, in Alaska Native villages. Um, through the 80s for the Anchorage Daily News. And um, it was a, um, um, it kind of had a small life. It was published in New York by Henry Holt. And then it was just recently reissued by the University of Alaska Press who have a um, classic reprint series. Um, so um, got to be a classic in my own lifetime. That was kind of, a, felt good. Um, so that was my first book, and this is my third. Um, and uh, I was referring to the Pilgrim book. Yeah, right. Yeah, of course. Pilgrim Wilderness. So, yeah. That's yeah, the that only was, one that, that I was the so big far. one. That, that was the one that yeah. that sold a lot of copies and got reviewed everywhere. So, um, yeah, um, and uh, the uh, yeah, 
maybe we'll see if we can come up with a fourth one somewhere. Um, this is Karen. I just wanted to um, see if Mary Manguso wanted to finish her comment now that her dog has calmed down. She had anything more to say as our renowned uh, retired UAF history professor. Mary, you're on mute. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I hit the wrong button. Well, Susan, doc, um, I have nothing more to say. I think it's a valuable part of, of Alaskan history as an Alaskan historian. Um, and I am... <laughs> What does the dog have to say about this? The dog, the dog is jealous. She she does this when I talk on the phone too. <laughs> she 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 thinks she she deserves undivided attention all of the time. You're a good dog. Get down. Get down. Get down. Down. Anyway, I think it fills in a a, a really nice gap in the history of Alaska. It's great. I was, you know, I'm not trained as a historian, and so I sometimes ask myself if, if I needed more of a thesis or more of a, you know, um, explanation of what what this all means and how it all ties together. And I tried to do that in more of a poetic way than in a sort of yeah. uh, programmatic way. I, I think it. I think it's fine. <laughs> Good. I I, I approve. Great. Thank you. you did a great job. Thank you. Thanks. Well, it's nice to talk to you. Um, I hadn't really talked to anyone in Fairbanks yet about this. And, um, you know, it'd be fun to come up to the university and do a presentation sometime if, uh, if that ever works out. Um, so um, I'll just sort of see, see what happens. Although January probably wouldn't have been my choice being a, a softy <laughs> living in Homer. Um, might uh, you might consider an Osher uh, class with what uh, an Osher uh, Osher lifelong learning Osher lifelong learning okay mm -hmm. it's very popular here. Well, thank you very much for for doing this first day, and the word is now out in Fairbanks. Your book sales in this area will be going up. I'm oh good. Sure. <laughs> thank you so much. Good good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Tom. Bye bye. Bye, Karen. Um, bye. And remember Thank you. A, plug, a plug for Karen. She's going to be talking next next month. All right. So I am going to end the meeting unless someone has something to say to me. All right. I'm ending the meeting. <laughs>